conferences, including booking wonderful speakers like Wendy. So without further ado then, I will hand it over to Wendy and she can get started. Great. It's awesome to see that uh, demogra democratic process happening right here, right? <laughs> Definitely no bias uh, in that voting process. So it's great to be here. My name is Wendy De La Rosa. I am the co-founder and head of research of a research lab called Common Sense Lab. What we do is basically try to use behavioral economics to help fintech companies, credit unions, and nonprofits to help Americans make better financial decisions. And how did I land in this position is a question that I get asked often. Um, you know, I grew up in the Dominican Republic, a small Caribbean island, uh, and at the time that I was growing up, we were under a dictatorship, and so we had zero choices, right? Um, we had one, one brand of Coke, we had one brand of sugar, and that was what you ate. And so when I emigrated to the United States, I was inundated by the number of choices that uh, were presented to me. And it was very clear to me from day one that part of the American way, right, part of the American culture is to have as many choices as you want, right? There's even Burger King's slogan, have it your way. Um, and then recently, my husband and I went to Home Depot and we wanted to get a blue blue paint, we were painting and renovating a room. And now all of a sudden, something that I thought was gonna take me five minutes ended up taking 45 minutes. We didn't make a decision. I left angry at my husband. Uh, we had a fit, sent him to go pick up the, the paint by himself, and of course he chose the wrong paint, right? Uh, and so now we're in, this, we're in the situation where choices are sort of impacting our decision making. And I'm sure all of you know Sheena Iyengard's work over at Columbia University basically showing that the more choices we have typically leads us to not make a choice at all. That's not surprising. We all know that. We've all read the popular books. But I think the interesting part of that study that often gets overlooked, it's what's happened to satisfaction. So oftentimes people say, well, you know what, people understand that more choices will lead to less action, but this is the American way, and with more choices, I'll be more satisfied with my choice. And what turns out is that when we have more choices, what happens? We start thinking about the what if, right? This is sort of the tinders of the world, right? You can, you can think about it in your dating life, right? You can think about going on a date with Joe, but what about Mike? What about Steve? They're so easy to access, we start thinking about the what if, and we call that counterfactual thinking. So the more choices we have often reduces our satisfaction. So I was working at a private equity investor, as a private equity investor at Goldman, and I had this portfolio company that had just had a hard time selling this amazing product. And I became frustrated, right? As an investor, you sort of want to see your ROI. And I was like, why isn't this thing selling? It's such a great product. And I started reading about behavioral economics. I got sort of, I became in love with it. So went back to Penn, did some research with Adam Grant, sort of quit my day job, and all of a sudden, here we are. Um, a couple of years later, PhD in sort of um, psychology and consumer behavior. And so when I met Kristen, I was always interested in the financial decision-making space. Is one of my verticals that I covered as a private equity investor. And it's one of these, these realms where we're just not doing enough to help Americans make better financial decisions. So about a year and a half ago, we partnered with MetLife Foundation to start this research lab called Common Sense Lab. And what we do is try to help people make better financial decisions across five realms, right? Increasing long and short-term savings, decreasing expenses, managing cash flow, and then increasing earnings. Right, so pretty broad mandate. And one of the things that we've sort of focused on is this question, right? We did a, a qualitative and quantitative survey with about 1,000 Americans, and we just sort of asked them about their savings. And it turns out that almost 40% of Americans have less than $500 in savings, including their retirement accounts. That's the world that we're living in. Now your question could be like, why is this happening? Why aren't people financially secure? And you can think about all of these policy situations, but one of the key answers that we often get is that people just don't know what they need, or people just don't know, 
what they need to do, right? And so we created a survey and we asked people on a scale of one to 100, how much do you agree with the statement? Right, I am financially secure. And on average people, the average answer was about a 35, right? So people are highly aware that they're not financially secure, right? Below 50 is disagree, above 50 is agree. And so then you can say maybe people just, just don't want to be financially secure, right? Maybe they're fine just living in poverty and not having savings, in which case we're solving a problem that doesn't exist. So then we ask people, how much do you agree with the following statement? I want to become financially secure. Right. Again, on a scale of one to 100, the average answer was a 95, meaning that people were sliding that slider all the way to the maximum. Right. People deeply want to be financially secure. They know that they're not financially secure. So then a reasonable person would say, well, maybe they just don't know how. Right. Maybe they just don't know how. So we ask people to list as many actions as they can possibly think of that they can do in the next month to improve their financial security. So they can list as many as they wanted to. Uh, and then we had a financial advisor sort of go through all of those answers and check which ones were sort of reasonable or not, right? Did people have the right intuition? And so it turns out that 92% of respondents listed three or more actions that they could do in the next month to improve their financial security. So people are not financially secure, they want to be, and they know what to do to get there, so what's wrong? And so this is a question that uh, oftentimes we think that financial education, just teaching people what to do is gonna solve this issue, and in fact, that's not the case. In a meta-analysis done by John Lynch and others over um, at the Center for Financial Decision Making at Boulder, they did a meta-analysis analyzing over 200 studies that have been done trying to understand the impact of financial education on financial behavior. So if I teach you about financial education, do you then save more? And what they found is that financial education programs accounted for 0.1% of the variance in financial behaviors. So, so not zero, right, but pretty close to it. And what's sad about it, about the stat, is that it was lower for lower income Americans and the effects wore off over time. So think about all of your tax dollars are sort of being spent on these financial education programs. Right? We have to ask ourselves, what's the ROI? In the US, it's, cl it's close to six, $760 million. We even have a, an entire commission on financial education. All right, so now that you're pretty depressed <laughs> um, and you understand that education doesn't lead to behavior change, what can we do? And this is what, I think this is like the good news of everything, is that we can design the environment in which people make choices. We have the ability to do that. Uh, and the way that we at Common Sense sort of design environments is by using what we call a 3B framework. We're not very creative. All of the frameworks are with B, so it's a 3B framework, right? The first part is we hone in on the behavior. And so if you're a product manager and you sort of are facing a problem, most of the time when we work with companies, they say, you know, I just want to increase engagement. Engagement is not a behavior, right? You can't measure engagement. How engaged does someone be? What's a behavior? How many times someone has logged into your app? How long they've retained? What's their average duration? Those are metrics that you can measure. And then once you have those uncomfortable specific measures, now we can start building an environment designed to encourage or discourage that behavior. Our team uh, went, worked with a company, and it was really funny, we, we sort of recorded top 20 execs and just said, you know, what is the key behavior that your company needs to do in order to become successful? And this is a really important question right, for any company. Everybody should be aligned on that. And we had 19 different answers. So the first step is really getting uncomfortably specific about what your key behavior is. The second step is sort of outlining all of the key barriers, the things that are standing in the way of your user or your consumer acting on that key behavior. 
And what I want to convince you today is that every click, every choice, every decision, every signature page is a, is a barrier. Even something as simple as having an open text field, that's a barrier. And so you want to design this environment in order to make it as easy as possible for someone to sort of reach that key behavior. Now there are instances where we want to increase the barriers, right? What are some instances in which as a, from a policy standpoint, we would want to increase be the barriers to reaching a behavior? Right, so, right, so uh, our friend just said increasing barriers to getting high interest loans or predatory loans, right, for people who will sort of suffer from, from the cycle. And what are some barriers we could do, right, make it harder for people to access those loans, put a fine, have 10 different forms of identity checks and before someone gets it, right, there's all of these things. So it's not always just about reducing barriers. Sometimes you actually want to increase barriers. And then the last part of this framework is what we call adding or reframing benefits. So oftentimes we do things not because they're the right things for us to do. We do things maybe for the wrong reasons. So Ideas 42, which is a behavioral science lab uh, that started over in the, uh, in the UK, they wanted to get people to insulate their roofs. Right? They'll save a lot of money on their energy consumption if they insulate. And they had people knock on doors and said, we'll do it for you, it's free. And what did most people say? No. I don't want a stranger in my attic. What are you doing? Like, I don't have time for this. this it's fine. So then they tried a different approach. They said, hey, we'll come, we'll reorganize your attic. We'll organize your attic for you. And then, hey, while we're at it, we'll also insulate it. Now, all of a sudden, opt-in rates went through the roof, right? Why? Because the benefit of insulating, as important as it may, be, may seem to all of us and to policymakers, is not necessarily an immediate benefit. It's not something that people care about. Right? If you're now telling me that you're going to organize my attic, great, go ahead, do whatever you want up there. Right? It's, sort of, it's, a, it's all about adding the Nutella on the carrot. Right? <laughs> How can we, exactly. Like every salad I eat, I think I'm eating, I'm eating so healthy and yet I drowse it in salad dressing. So that's, that's all about increasing our, our, the benefits. I think because, as you guys know, we're, so, we're extremely focused on financial decision making, we want to take this framework and talk about a couple of experiments that we've done last year. So if you're interested about learning more about Common Sense, we published our annual report earlier this year. But we worked with roughly 17 companies and ran over 18 randomized controlled trials. And so I'm just going to highlight a couple of things that I think you'll find interesting that you can bring to your own product or companies. Uh, but feel free to ask questions at any time. Sound like a plan? Great. You got one thumbs up. All right, so we're going to talk about four potential experiments. The first one is who knows a company named Digit? Okay, so Digit is, a couple of you guys know it, but Digit is a fintech company in, based in San Francisco. They automatically take small amounts of money from your checking account in the hopes of building up a short-term savings account for you. So you sign up, and every day they'll take a couple of dollars from your checking account, and then lo and behold, you're sort of, you will build an emergency savings account over time. Now the question that we had with Digit was, are you doing enough to help people build up their short-term savings? Now, one of the key times for saving is tax refund time. So most of Americans who file get a tax refund. Right? It's kind of crazy we're giving the government zero interest loan and then happy when we get that money back. Uh, but it's on the order of $3,100. And what's amazing about this is that when you think about the U.S. as a whole, where the median income is just $51,000, this is roughly one, one paycheck if someone's getting paid on a biweekly basis and an after-tax basis for an American household. This is a chunkable size. Uh, like this is a chunkable check. 
And so how can we leverage this timing to help people increase their short-term savings? One way you can do it is at the time that people get their tax refund, you can ask them and say, hey, what percentage of your tax refund would you like to save? Or would you like to save part of that? That's sort of the approach that the US government has taken. When you file your taxes, some of you may not know this, but you have the option of filing a form 8888, another wonderfully unimportantly named form. <laughs> Uh, but that form allows you to split your tax refund across a checking account and a savings account and no cost to you. All right, an amazing program took the US government years to build. You can also, by the way, split it and um, invest in savings bonds. 0.5% of American tax filers actually file form 8888. Right. And so we said to ourselves, okay, is there something else that we could do? Can we hone in to this concept of pre-commitment because the temptation when someone gets $3,100 is really high, right? I have it in my checking account. I have all of these bills I need to pay. I've been in living in scarcity for so long, living paycheck to paycheck, why not treat myself, right? In the now, temptation is at an all-time high. But what happens when we think about the future? In the future, I'm gonna save. In the future, I'm gonna work out. In the future, I'm gonna eat healthy. In the future, I'm gonna lose weight. In the future, I'm gonna turn into Beyonce, right? The future is just perfect for everybody, right? And so when I can get you in a mind, mindset of thinking about the future, making decisions, when the future is so far away, you're likely to think more rationally. So we honed in into this concept of pre-commitment, which means that if I can get you to commit to something today, that you're going to do in the future, you're more likely to do it. So for example, um, stick.com is an amazing website that you should all go to. But if you're trying to lose weight or have any goals, you can sign up to stick.com and you can say, hey, I wanna go to the gym three times a week. If you don't go to the gym three times a week, stick.com will automatically deduct money from your checking account. So you're committing to something in the future, right? I'm not losing any money now, and because I think that in the future I'm gonna be perfect, it's a great tool. Now the beautiful thing about stick.com, it was created in, by Yale researchers, is that not only do they take money from your checking account, they then send it to a charity that you hate. So whether you're pro-life or pro-choice, Democratic or Republican, whatever organization you loathe, that's where your money is gonna go to, right? So they're adding that extra sort of benefit in there. And to, to sum it up, pre-commitment is this concept of just the Ulysses contract, right? So if you remember that story, Ulysses had his men wear wax, he tied himself up to the mast because he knew that temptation was coming, and so he was making a decision today to make sure that his future self will act accordingly. So here's what we did with Digit. We had a, we random, we did a randomly controlled experiment where we split their entire base into two. And in the control experiment, we sent a text and we said, hey Thomas, you just got your tax refund. So we send this text message when someone just received their tax refund. And then we asked them, hey, what percentage of your tax refund would you like to save? And people could text back anything from zero to 100 or just ignore. In our experiment condition, we texted people in early February, people who hadn't received their tax refund or at least Digit hadn't detected it. And we said, hey Thomas, you might get a tax refund, right, because we didn't know. If you do, what percentage of your tax refund would you like to save? Now this is a hard question, right? I don't know how much I'm gonna get. I know what I got last year. But now you're asking me to think about something that's gonna happen in the future. Hmm, that seems kind of difficult. But at least I'm sort of asking you that question now about something that's gonna happen in the future. So you're committing to something now. And whatever percentage people texted back, Digit automatically deducted that money when the tax refund came. So what happened? We had about 27% of people respond to the text message. I think one of the key learnings here is that if you have the ability to do email or text, text is just a great tool for you to reach people, right? When you're emailing people, you have a 30% opt-in rate, a 30% open rate, maybe 35, maybe 40 at best. 
Then on top of that, you have to think about a 10% click-through rate of everybody who opened it. So at the end of this funnel, you're sort of looking at a 1% conversion rate, if that. Text message is a different world, right? We get that thing, we're, forced, we're sort of forced to look at it. And so if you have the ability and you're doing something important for the world, leverage it. All right, so then what were the average savings rates? This chart is a little bit hard to read, but in the control experiment, about everybody who texted wanted to save about 10% of their tax refund. Right, so this was people who just received their tax refund. We asked them, what percentage would you like to save? On average, they said 10%. For people who hadn't received their tax refund, right, who expected it in the future, now they wanted to save 15%. Again, in the future, I'm perfect. I'm gonna make decisions today for my perfect future self. Now, the other thing that was sort of interesting, right, is that those graphs included everybody, including people who said zero. Now, about 50% of the people who texted wanted to save something Right, so they said something greater than zero. And when we took a look at those people, the difference only increased. So everybody who wanted to save in the control, on average, was about 12% of their tax refund. That's how much they wanted to save. But in the experiment, people now wanted to save 22% of their tax refund. Huge differences just by changing the timing and leveraging this concept of pre-commitment. Overall, we sort of saved a million dollars for over a million dollars for digit users just by sending a text. And then the question that you should all be having is like, well, you know, maybe people say, yes, I'm gonna be perfect, but when you know, push comes to shove and the tax refund hits, they just withdraw it immediately. Well, it turns out that's not the case. Roughly about 85% of the savings were still in the account three months out. So think about ways in which you can use pre-commitment in your own product. Wait, what are some ways in which you can get someone to commit something today that's gonna affect them in the future? A perfect program, I'll get to you in just a bit, a perfect program that sort of leveraged this is called the Save More for Tomorrow program. And Dick Taylor over the University of Chicago has sort of coined this term. But in the US, a lot of people are not saving for retirement. The main vessel to save for retirement is a 401k, and the participation rates are abysmal. On top of that, the, uh, the default contribution rate is somewhere between three and 4%. No one is gonna be able to live in retirement just by saving three or 4% of their income. So what Dick Taylor did was essentially get people to agree to a program in where that contribution rate increased every time people got a raise. Because if you were to tell someone right now who was contributing 4% to say, hey, you need to up the, your percentage to 15%, that feels terrible. I barely have enough money now, how can I survive? I'm used to my budget. But in the future, when I get a tax refund, my future self is gonna be better. Yeah, I can agree to increasing my 401k contribution when I get a, when I get a raise. All right, so that's, again, using that concept of pre-commitment, getting someone to commit to something today for their perfect future self. You had a question, sir. So I just wanted to check back. Uh, when they agreed that they were gonna save a certain amount, that wasn't automatically transferred into savings. They still have to actually deposit it. I don't know if you said that or not. Yeah, so once the tax refund, great question. Was it, once a tax refund hit the account, the money was automatically transferred. That's one of the beauties of, of Digit as a tool, right? that they can automatically move money in and out. Yeah. Okay, any more questions on that Digit experiment? All right, so let's move on to our second experiment. We did it with a company called Propel. They're based out of New York. And what Propel does is really, is, is just really amazing. They work with people who are on SNAP or otherwise known as food stamps. And what they do is that they just simply show them their food stamp balance. Now before Propel, if I was a SNAP recipient and I used my card at Safeway to buy groceries for my family, I then had to call a 1-800 number on the back of my card in order to find out how much money I had left on my card. Or 
I had to make a purchase at a store, and then my balance was printed on a receipt. Terrible incentive program, right? Like people just want to know how much do I have to spend, and so Propel sort of built out this API and this great app called Fresh EBT. Now the interesting thing about the SNAP program is that people have a lot of misconceptions about the food stamp program. Generally, one in seven individuals in the U.S. are on SNAP at any one time. And on average, you know, this is just like $250 for a household a month, right? It's not enough to um, do your entire grocery shopping, but it's enough to help somebody in a tough situation. And all of the funds are distributed once a month. Usually, most states have this program. They're distributed once a month on this card. Now, what's interesting is that most, th this sort of way of dis dispersing funds has a bunch of psychological effects. Now think about yourself when you get a paycheck, right? How do you spend on payday versus the last day before your payday? Different, right? In one world, you feel a little bit richer. In another world, you feel a little bit scarcer. And we call that the windfall effect. When we feel richer, when we feel like we have a lot of resources available to us, we're more likely to misallocate our funds or do things that we wouldn't, looking back, necessarily agree with. So with Fresh EBT and Propel, we first did an analysis of all of their users just to see how are people spending their food stamps. So in an ideal world, and by the way, we all suffer, so this is not just food stamp recipients, we all suffer from this. In an ideal world, we have an ideal consumption, right, where we're slowly depleting our funds over time, there's no lumps. What ends up happening, though, is that you can see in this graph, is that by day nine, so nine days after these people receive their, their uh, SNAP deposit, they wasted 80% of it. They've spent 80% of it. That's a better word than, than wasted. And roughly about two weeks out, they, they practically have zero left. And so if you think about what happens to that family during the last two weeks, there are a bunch of studies showing that kids go hungry. They perform worse in school because there's just no food left. Cal calorie consumption goes down. So this is not a story about bulk buying because if people were just bulk buying, that's great. Buy in bulk, you don't have to go to the store as many times. But calorie consumption is still going down, meaning people are going hungry. So we asked ourselves, how can we help people budget a little bit better or make or smooth out that spending curve? And we can't be the US government. We can't change how these funds are dispersed, but we could change how they're displayed. So again, we did a randomized control trial. We split uh, the population into two. We had about 4,000 users go through this experiment, 2,000 in each. And in the control, this is sort of the typical um, home screen for a Propel user. Where you see you have $16 on food stamps, you know when your next um, deposit will arrive. If you get cash benefits, some people do, you'll see that. And your latest activity. In our experiment condition, all we said was, here's your weekly recommended budget. And we just divided their deposit by four and said this is how much you should spend a week, but they can also see their total balance, their cash, when their next deposit is going to be. These are two different users, but um, all of them, if the data was available, also saw how much they were gonna get in their next deposit as well. Now, this is pulling on the concept of anchoring, which we're all familiar with, right? Which is the fact that whatever number you're sort of primed with first, has consequences in your downstream decision making. So if I prime you as an example to think about the last two digits of your social security number, and some of you now are doing that, that, that number will then impact a follow-up question. So if I ask you how much you wanted to pay for a bottle of wine, those of you who have a high last two digits of your social security number, like 89, will pay higher than those of you who have a lower social security number, like 11. Because our minds are trained to anchor our numbers and adjust from that. So if I focus you on any one number, you're gonna anchor on that and then adjust accordingly 
but oftentimes we don't adjust enough. So what happened in the experiment? Well, 30 days out in our experiment condition, we were able to push out that spending curve by roughly two days. Now, it's important to note that we didn't change the amount that was being distributed. We didn't change how it was being distributed. All we said was, here's your weekly recommended budget. And all of a sudden, people were delaying their purchase. That's huge for a family that's sort of living at the edge. right? So not all of us, but, but think, imagine someone who straight off on a daily basis is taking the bus or buying food. OK, the question that you should all be asking yourselves is, did we impact what type of purchases these people made? So maybe they're elongating their consumption curve, or maybe they're just buying unhealthier things or cheaper things, in which case that's not good either. So throughout this, this experiment, which we ran for three months, we asked people to self-report on a weekly basis hey, how much soda did you consume? How many chips? How many vegetables? How many fruits, et cetera, both in control and in the experiment? And we found no differences. Now, of course, this is self-reported data, but it's encouraging to know that we didn't sort of impact what people bought. We just impacted how they budgeted. Think about your own budgeting problems. Everybody has issues with budgeting. It's very hard to sort of pay rent that's on a monthly basis even though we get usually get paid on a weekly or bi-weekly basis, we have to budget ourselves. How easy would it be if someone just told us a weekly recommended budget? Oftentimes, many fintech companies that we talk to, they're so focused on this daily recommended budget. And the problem is, on a daily basis, there's too much variance. That number becomes obsolete because it's always wrong. But on a weekly basis, we tend to normalize a little bit, and it becomes much more salient, more correct, and people are more likely to pay attention to it. Any questions on this experiment? I'm slightly confused because I thought, I'm slightly confused because I thought that the part of the purpose was not just to improve budgeting. It was to, it was to change. It was to mean that people had more to eat in the, in the later parts of the week, and you, so, You've improved budgeting, but people still starved in the last two weeks of the cycle, or, or am I not understanding that? No, no, no. I think um, you're calling out a great point. So in the last couple of weeks here, right, everybody still goes to zero because $250 is just not enough, right? But what we were able to do is sort of eliminate that pain. So instead of someone going hungry for, let's just say, 10 days, they now go hungry for eight days. Right, because we're sort of smoothing out that consumption curve even more. Great clarifying question. Okay. All righty. Um, so we talked a lot about fintech companies. I wanted to at least like show you a little bit of a flavor of an experiment that we did with a credit union uh, called LCCU. So LCCU is a credit union operates mostly on the East Coast, and most of their consumers are Latino. And one of the things that they found from their users is that a lot of people, when they get their check, they just cash them, or they go to check cashers and get all of the money in cash. And the problem with that is that they now become targets of theft, because you're carrying around so much cash on your person at any one time, and you know, Friday, everybody knows that Friday is typically a payday. And so LCCU wanted to get people away from this behavior and think about ways in which they can deposit at least part of that money into a savings account. They have about 62,000 members, and you can sort of see um, just like the dire situation of their population, right? So 65% of their new customers were previously unbanked. 85% of them are low income. Right, and so they're really targeting a, re, uh, a really high need population. And about 18% in the survey sort of did this, what we were just talking about, right? Cash their entire check. Um, okay, so one of the things that we do 
is we go in with our 3B framework and we say, okay, for someone to make a deposit, what is it that they have to do? For someone to cash their check, what is it that they have to do? So think about the last time you went into a bank teller. In order for you to deposit money, what do you have to do? You have to write a deposit slip, right? And then you have to stand in line, go see a bank teller, give them the cash, they then deposit it. When you go into a, a bank and you want to cash a check, what do you have to do? Wait in line, right? There's no deposit slip. And so now, we're not playing in an even playing field. One of them is, is inherently harder to do, unclear why, right? So in one scenario, when I'm trying to deposit something, I have to fill out a deposit check. In one scenario, when I'm just trying to cash my check, there's no barrier in order to do that. I can just cash my whole check. So we created this intervention where in order to cash your check, you now have to fill out a deposit slip. So this is an example of us increasing the barriers in order to stop an unwanted behavior. And so this was a check cashing slip. And then uh, we, we utilized some some defaults, right? Where it was automatically pre-checked, I want to deposit 50% of my check if they wanted to, or they can cross that out and say, I want to deposit this amount. They can always deposit 100% of their check if they wanted to, right? But now we're getting into an even playing field. We're adding this barrier, just like that. this barrier was added in order to deposit an account. What did we find? 10% of people just decided to deposit part of their paycheck just by adding this deposit form. And of those 10% that decided to save part of their check, on average, they saved about $169. Now, if you think back to our first slide where I mentioned that 40% of Americans have less than $500 in savings, $169 is a meaningful number. And so as you're thinking about your product design, product changes, playing with barriers is really important and looking at it as like a hacker, essentially saying what, how many clicks does someone need to take? How many steps does someone need to take in order to reach my key behavior? How does that compare to other key behaviors that they're doing and how can I make them even? That's gonna be a useful exercise between you, your PM, your designers, whoever. Any questions on this one? A re-elected VP, right? Do we? Do you know offhand what percentage that 169 represented, even in an average situation? Um, we don't. That was information that LCCU um, didn't necessarily want to share because in order for us to get that information, we needed to get access to material non-public information, their small credit union is really hard for them to, <laughs> um, d yeah, to to really disguise their members. But also, all of your companies, I'm sure, have an amazing database. These guys have two people in a back room, <laughs> so so we we don't. Um, but what we do know is that if this is we just rolled it out in a couple branches, but if this trend continues across all of their branches, we sort of estimate that this type of intervention can save $2.1 million for their users just by printing off a piece of paper. Okay, um, are, how are we doing? Do we wanna do one more? Sure. Yeah, all right, I got a strong thumbs up from the back. So the last one that I wanna talk to you about is a, an experiment we did in conjunction with a company called Payable. Anybody know Payable? So Payable um, focuses on 1099 workers, and they make it easy for 1099 workers to get paid. So if I wanted to hire independent contractors, I would download Payable, and Payable makes it easy for me to track their hours, send them their payments um, directly to their checking account. One of the things that we found after analyzing their, their database is that as as you guys can imagine, independent contractors have high variability in their income. It's about a 10x gap 
between their minimum check in any one month and their maximum check in any, in any one month. Um, and at least for a payable space, you know, this independent contractors, they were just making about $6,000, right? Um, it's not necessarily that a lot of these people were becoming rich as an independent contractor. Think of these guys as the Lyft drivers and the Uber drivers of the world, right? What's even more difficult is that as an independent contractor, it's extremely hard for you to save. Taxes aren't deducted automatically from your paycheck. People have to think ahead and save part of their, their funds for taxes. There's no concept of a 401k, right? I, had then, I have to open up a SEP, uh, which is the equivalent of an IRA, and it's you know all the forms that come along with it. And so it's just very hard for people to just have auto savings as a tool if you're an independent contractor. So we decided to do something about it. Payable created this tool that automatically helped people every time they got a check from their independent contracting work, they could set what percentage they wanted to save. That's great. But we thought, can we up that a little bit by adding some benefits? So we talked a lot about reducing barriers. Now let's talk about adding some benefits. So we just sent an email, and the beauty about Payable is that they have a crazy high open rates, about 80% open rates. Why? People want to know how much they're getting paid and when, right? People pay attention to these emails. Uh, they're not your spam, you know, Macy's emails that you rarely open. And so what they did, what we did was we had a control condition over on the left where if someone got a paycheck, this person got $275, and typically how payable will report it is just saying, you're making $12.50 for 18 hours, you got $50 in tips, that adds up to $275. Right? So you have a breakdown on an hourly basis, typically, of how much you've made. Now for this person in our uh, experimental condition, we said, can we up the benefits? Because if I'm having someone think about their paycheck on an hourly basis, I'm keeping them in a world of scarcity. Think about the difference when I tell you you're making $15 an hour or $30,000 an hour. Even though they're $30,000 a year, excuse me. I would love to make $30,000 an hour. That would be amazing. Uh, next year, right, when I'm Beyonce. Um, <laughs> But those, those two numbers are roughly equivalent. One of them makes you feel a little richer. One of them makes you feel a little poorer. And so in our experiment condition, we sort of took all of the earnings from this person and said, you're making a round, and then extrapolated that number to say how much you're making on an annual basis. $11,000 for this person from XYZ client. And then, the same question to everybody. How much would you like to save from this paycheck? Zero, one, three, six, 12, 20%. What did we find? So as I mentioned, 80% of people across both conditions that had the same subject line open the email. But just even in the control condition where we just presented this option to people, you now have 10% of people opting in to save something. Right? So I think even without the experiment, that's a great learning. The fact that if you make it easy for people to save, there, some, of, some people will opt in and will say, yes, I want to save something. So about 10% of people saving part of their, their income just by sending an email. And in this one, we still had the same percentage of people clicking through. Right, uh, but they were much more likely to click something other than zero, which is kind of crazy, right? So if you if you get that intention, I'm now shifting people away from zero into the one, three, six, and twelve percent. So as a percentage of everybody who clicked, in the per job basis in that control, about forty three percent of people clicked wanting to save something. But when you looked at that same base of everybody who clicked, 
you now have 58% of people wanting to save something, so something other than zero. That's, that's pretty meaningful given that all we're doing is getting people in a different mindset. We're adding an additional benefit to what their paycheck it already is. We're creating a long-term mindset. We're having them think about a yearly basis. We're sort of magnifying their paycheck by using different framing tactics. And through that, we're able to get people to think more long-term and more likely to save. All right, so that is all that I have uh, for you guys. If you are interested in learning more about what we do, like I said, we have all of our experiments written up at commonsenselab.org. But I hope what you take away from this is, one, you can teach it away. You can educate it away. You can get someone in a room, talk to them for four hours on financial decision making, and expect them to make better decisions. Temptation in the world is just too high. Our choice environments change and direct behavior much more than any four-hour session can do. And that's not just constrained to financial decision making. In 2009, when New York City decided to put calorie labels, to force restaurants to put calorie labels on every menu item, the theory there was if we just educate people and tell people how many calories are in each plate, they will eat less. And a, couple, a number of studies, mostly run by Brian Wansank over at Cornell, have shown that there was zero change in calorie consumption. Why? By the time someone walks into a McDonald's, is it a shocker that a hamburger is 1,000 calories that is not healthy for us? No. By the time someone walks into a McDonald's, the aroma of the hamburger, the french fries, the neon lighting, all of that is having a much bigger impact than that small calorie label right next to it. The environment matters a lot more than whatever we're trying to teach people. And so as you guys are designing your own products, try to take away that intuition, break it away. You can't teach it away. You have to design the environment for it. How do you design the environment for it? We've come up with this framework that seems to work for us. It's called the three Bs, right? Focus is on the behavior, map out all of the barriers and start knocking them down or increasing them depending on what you want to do, and then magnify or amplify the benefits. And that is it, folks. Any questions? That was great. Thank you. All right, so we'll keep questions on the microphone so that they're recorded. Am I allowed to add something instead of a question? Um, Kelly McGonigal had a, a course where she talked about behavior change. Mm -hmm. And one of the examples she gave about how not only does education not work, but how it actually backfires is in the 70s when they started printing on cigarette packages the blackened lungs. The thinking was that this would scare people so much that they would quit smoking. And instead, it did the opposite because they were like, oh, I'm gonna die anyway, I better light up another pack. <laughs> so it, it backfired because it seemed like a lost cause. It was too scary, so they shut it down. Yeah, so I don't know that specific study, but I do know um, of the study that was done with high school students. So um, billboards typically were changed around that time period to say, warning, um, this is dangerous for you. And so then for high school students, being dangerous is cool. And so there was an increase in cigarette consumption amongst teenagers, which is something that in a society we may not want. So um, that, that, I think that's been well documented, but that's a great, I didn't know about that, that example, that's great. I was curious, hi, Ellen Francis. I was curious about the initial framing of the problem that you had and then the range of solutions. The range of solutions that you have are very concrete very incremental, show immediate improvement. The framing question you had was, do you feel financially secure and do you know what to do to be financially secure? And that's a very big, very broad question, mm -hmm. right? Even if I know three things to do, well, I may know more. Which of them do I do? How effective will they be? Will I, at the end of this, feel more financially secure as opposed to, well, I've saved some more money. So I'm wondering about the, the scale of the question and the scale of the answers. Yeah, no, I think you bring up a great point. One of the things um, 
that in this, in this meta study by John Lynch, they basically looked at all different types of financial education. Some of them just teaching about one savings behavior at a time, others sort of helping people rank behaviors, right? So focus on saving first, then focus on paying down debt, sort of really enumerating to people which step to take at a time. And there were no differences in sort of just changing in behaviors given w that type of intervention and that second type of intervention. Right? So it seems so, so far in the research that even just answering that question, what should I do first and what will have a bigger impact, still doesn't change behavior. The one thing that has been shown in the financial education space to change behavior is having a coach. Um, and we think that at least in the field right now, we think that's less about the education that's being delivered and more about the fact that someone's coming into your house on a weekly basis or you have to go see someone on a weekly basis. And so there's a level of accountability that I have to face someone that's gonna see that I haven't saved for the past week and now I have to justify myself. And we have this innate need to sort of present ourselves in the best possible light against strangers, <coughs> against friends, et cetera. And so we think that the majority of that impact in terms of coaching is coming from that. But I, I, I hear your point and is, is one that often gets asked, but the research doesn't, doesn't suggest that that may be what's going on. Hi, thanks um, for great examples. And when I listen to you, I'm, I think like, oh yeah, that, of course, that totally makes sense. We should use anchoring, right? Instead of saying, this is what we have monthly, this is a recommended weekly budget. But then like coming up with this solution is actually probably not that easy. So I'm curious, can you walk us a bit through how the design process works to, to create these experimental interventions if you want? Yeah, um, so we're of the belief, at least in the financial decision making space, where the bar is so low, like people are not saving. And so the question about figuring out the right amount specifically that's tailored to you and creating an algorithm that like matches your specific spending to the, to the dime, that's a five year down the road question, maybe 10, 20, I don't know. Like we're so far from, tr from trying to m optimize, we just need to get people to save. And that's where we are. And so when we designed this intervention, I, I, I was very honest with you guys to say, we just divided the deposit by four and try to anchor people on that number because I know for sure that that number is better than just showing you the total. Now how much better is $35 versus $40? That's a question from down the road, but the baseline is so low for a lot of these financial behaviors that sort of optimizing for that um, I think it's like a V10, right? Um, and, and so the way that we typically go through the design process is we bring in partners six months at a time. We do uh, analysis of their, their user, the behaviors that users are doing right now. So our team is sort of split between data scientists, researchers, um, and product managers who sort of understand how to build products in a quick, in a quick way. And so we spent about four weeks just understanding current user behavior. What are people doing right now? Then after we feel like we have a handle on what current behaviors are happening, then we start into the, what we call the pre-testing phase, which is before we build anything in product, we use tools like Amazon Turk to run experiments with panels. We typically don't rely on focus groups because what's beautiful about the human mind is that we can rationalize every decision we make. I'm sure all of you guys know about the organ donation opt-in, opt-outs, right? Like Germany versus Austria, wildly different organ donation rates. It turns out the real reason for that difference is because one form people are opting in to become an organ donor, and another form is that because people are opting out. When you ask people in those countries, why did you decide to be an organ donor? People who are in an opt-out world, right, they will say, well, because I'm a global citizen, because it's the right thing to do, because I would want an organ if I ever got into an accident. People who are in an opt-in scenario, right, where you have to check the box to become an organ donor, they say, why would I become an organ donor? I, if I ever get into an accident, I don't want the, the EMT to go see my ID and then leave me on the side of the road in order to just take my organs. Right? They create these like wonderful, realistic stories 
that makes you think that people have really thought about this question deeply and have strong opinions about it. No one says, well, the way that the form was laid out, nudge me in one way, shape, or form, and I just didn't want to think about this because all I came for the DMV was to renew my license. I didn't want to think about the way that I was going to potentially die. Um, and so generally, what in our design process, we don't rely on qualitative data as much. Uh, we typically just look at behavior. I think qualitative data is useful for certain types of questions. Uh, and so then we, we run a bunch of different pretest experiments on tools like Amazon Turk, like I mentioned. Once we feel like we have a handle, we're seeing some movements in behavior, then we pretest it on a small scale, typically only a subset of users, and then we do our full launch. And that's our process. Uh, the other thing is if anybody wants to work with us, we kind of have them sign an agreement that any findings that we find have to be publicly shared with the world. So whatever we learn, we don't want it to live in an academic journal that no one reads or some company website. We want it to be shared with the world so that if other people are doing interesting things, trying to help people save more, decrease their expenses, they can learn. In the back. Um, so in all of these experiments, um, we saw the perspective from the company or the institution that wants that behavior to occur, right? After these experiments were done, did you take a look perspective of the users and whether that either improved the adoption of the product, engagement of the products, or just the appreciation, hey, wait a minute, I have $169 more in my bank than I did before? Yeah. Um, so we have a couple of, one, of things. So in the digit example, this was a tax refund example, we thought we were gonna get a bunch of calls when that money was taken out, saying like, what happened to my money? Um, digit didn't. For the Propel example, if you look at their reviews, once they rolled out this feature across their entire base, you see a ton of people saying how much they love the weekly recommended budget and their overall ratings went up on, on the Play Store and on the Apple Store. Again, that's not causal, right? That's just a relationship. So correlation, you know, I can't say, tell you like we caused this ex explicitly. Um, and in the LCCU example, the deposit one, one of the worries there was were people going to leave LCCU and go to another bank because they now had to fill out this form where people complain about it. Um, so I think one person complained that the, it was a new thing. And uh, we're still analyzing the data, but in, so far early results indicate that there hasn't been a change in total number of attendees to a branch. Uh, because these are small interventions, right? Uh, it's hard for people to know, you know any difference when they're just used to going to, to a bank. Um, the key thing is that they just want to get their money, right? Uh, it's very hard for people to, uh, to remember what they used to do you know, three months ago versus today. Um, and then we don't have that for payable, so I don't know. So we don't have any sort of consumer level data on what they thought about this feature. So I don't know. So uh, be in the beginning, you talked briefly about choice overload. Yeah. And I've been thinking a lot about the jitterbug cell phone lately. Are you familiar with the jitterbug? I'm not familiar with the so jitterbug. So it's kind of targeted at the elderly market, like they talk about, and you still hear a dial tone, and the operator can connect you, and all like in the good old days, it actually says that in their copy. Okay. But it's really uh, much simpler, and they also ha now have a smartphone. But the whole idea is to reduce the number of features and the number of choices, it seems to me. I was just wondering if you're aware of other products that were following a, sing a similar path. I know they've been around for several years, so they must be doing at least reasonably well. Yeah. Um, so I think there, you have seen in general just a consolidation of, of choices. Um, Common Sense didn't um, do this because we weren't around as an entity, but the core team, Dan Ariely and Kristen, sort of uh, worked with Netflix, and this is years ago, so forgive me if I don't have exact numbers. Uh, but if you think about Netflix, right, you're sort of creating this, this difficult choice about what movie you want to watch next, or what is it that you want to watch next. Um, 
And then in drowning in that decision, you can just decide not to watch something at all. What's a way that you can reduce that choice overload? Well, you can have the playback button to say, this is what's playing in the next seven seconds, right? And then you have that countdown right? in five, four, three, two, one. And then now all of a sudden you sort of reduce that choice. People can always exit if they want to, but they can continue watching the next episode of X, right? Um, that's an example very clearly of reducing choice overload and then just giving people an option. And if they always want to, they can X out of it and make, make, the, make a choice if they want to. But that's this very small product feature that I think is an example of that. Um, I think choice overload, this is gonna be a, a very unpopular decision. I think choice overload sometimes is, gets misused oftentimes. So um, people, Itamar Simonson over at Stanford has done a bunch of follow-up research on the choice overload. He basically found that when people are in an execution mode, so I know that I wanna buy shoes, more variety actually helps with conversion because I've already decided that I want to buy shoes. I'm, in, I'm just in execution mode. But when people are in browse mode, when they don't know, like I don't know if I want to buy shoes, maybe, maybe not, right? Or when you just want to get someone to buy something that or it wasn't in their basket beforehand, right? Now choice overload reduces action. And so I, I think it's one of these things where like really understanding choice overload and where to place it, it's great. So jitterbug, right, people are in an execution mode. They just wanna use the phone. I wanna reduce choices there. Hi. Oh, um, what's something you changed your mind about throughout the course of your research? Something that I've changed my mind about? Mm -hmm. um, hmm. Um, t -t 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 this is another question. This is another way of asking what's what's a couple of our failed experiments, of which we have tons of null effects uh, <laughs> that we found over time. I think one of the things for me uh, that I've changed is how difficult it actually is to get people to save. So I'll I'll, I'll give you an example. We we took over a couple of tax centers in New York City trying to get people to save part of their tax refund uh, and this, during this tax season. And we went through our whole 3B process and we thought, you know, we just need people to commit to a number and we need them to say it out loud and then they will save it. Um, and we did that and then we didn't see any changes in savings behavior. And what ended up happening was that the preparer, the tax person that was filling out their taxes, wouldn't ask them for the form or wouldn't ask them to say the percentage that they wanted to save. And so in fact, our intervention failed, not because pre-commitment didn't work, but because we didn't think through all of the specific barriers that were part of this ecosystem, like all of the specific steps. In fact, we missed a pretty big step, which was the preparers actually need to be incentivized in order to ask this question or need to be trained to ask this question in one way, shape, or form. So. The biggest thing that I've learned through doing this research has been the fact that understanding the barriers is much harder than you know what this framework makes it out to be because you have to be methodical and really think about it like a hacker, like sit down and write down every single step. Um, and then I think the, the other thing that I've changed my mind on, um, I wouldn't say changed, but become much more weary of is you know what, what's the impact of social proof, which is you know how likely I am to do something when I know other people around me are doing it, and at least in the financial decision making realm, it's hard to understand how people are interpreting that, right? So let's just say I know that everybody else here spends more than me. Is that going to make me spend more? Probably even though I know I already know that that's a bad behavior, but let's just say I know here, everybody here saves more than me. Is that more likely to make me save more? Well, research shows that it doesn't because now I think that all of you guys are doing better than me and I'm stuck in this place that I can't ever get out of. And so you get the what the hell effect. 
And so I think social proof, at least in the financial decision making realm, I think it's tricky and it's tough and it, it's probably much more nuanced that has been, than what has been talked about in the popular press. So we've gotten mixed results, I think, when we've tried to use it. Okay, okay, hi. Thanks, uh, great examples there. I was trying to think about one of the first initial statements that you made regarding financial education and sort of basically the lack of benefits associated with that. Yeah. And when I think about like lower income uh, Americans, I think, I would intuitively think that education is very important. For example, when you think about credit, right, and when they think about credit products and then not understanding sort of the concept of interest and therefore you get the payday loans and other check cashing and those kind of things, that seemed to be a pretty important piece of it, but I don't, maybe that's not because it's not behavior driven or is it sort of, I think of it as behavior like don't take that product. <laughs> um, but I think education is a big piece of that because if you don't understand the concept of interest, yeah. it would be fine. You know. So um, one, very difficult for anybody, regardless of income, to understand comp interest or compound interest. We typically just take shortcuts. So if you look at how people pay down their credit cards as an example, regardless if they're low income, they typically pay down their credit cards by paying the lowest amount balance first because then we feel like we're making progress, right? So if I have a credit card with $500 on it and I have another credit card with $25,000 on it, even though the $25,000 one has a higher interest rate, I'm much more likely to pay down the $500 one because I, now I knock out one of my two credit cards. That's a bias that regardless of, of income we see. We also see another bias where people just are likely to anchor on the minimum payment balance or they just pick a random round number that they think they can pay, which is like $50 or $100 or any multiple of 10. Not necessarily thinking about it you know, in a methodical way of which one of these cards has a higher highest interest rate. And so one of the things when you ask people, even if they're low income, it's very clear that people understand high interest rate is bad and low interest rate is good, right? Um, even low income, they understand high is bad and low is good. The question is, n they have this understanding and yet they're still taking these products. Why? And there's a whole host of reasons why, right? Like the, the, it's a lot easier to get money from a payday lender than it is from a bank. They have shorter turnaround times. The person behind the cash counter looks like them, speaks like them, builds a relationship much easier. There's so much transparency that's actually a benefit for payday lenders. So, you know, education is one of these tough ones where I c it's, it's hard, I'll be hard, I'm hard pressed to think about a concept that people really need to understand in order to meaningfully improve their life. Now, when we talk about optimizing, right, so let's optimize your portfolio between stocks and bonds now, we can talk about education. When we're talking about you need to invest and save for retirement, that's a different conversation. I think education just hasn't gotten people over that hump, over that step up, Jim. I'm curious about the companies and institutions you're working with. You mentioned the pre-commitment and availability. Can you talk more about what you've learned about working with them and uh, what that process is, what works, what doesn't? Yeah, um, so, there's a couple of things that we've learned. Uh, one is that we have to, if it's not on somebody's roadmap, uh, people don't get excited about it. And um, at least in the Bay, when you talk about experiments, you have to call it A-B testing. And people understand that, but they don't understand randomized control trials. That sounds too difficult. Uh, <laughs> so that's, that's a, you know, quick and funny learning. But I think the other thing is, all of these companies, that we, at least that we've worked with, want to do good. They just don't know how. Um, and they've been trained to get people in a room and do focus groups and build personas and separate everybody who they talk to and try to ca categorize them into a persona. So this is, this is our user base and we're gonna split them up between like the soccer mom and the techie and X, Y, or Z persona and you know, maybe sometimes that's useful. We find for these financial decisions um, and many of these like basic psychological principles there's no need to think about personas in that way because we're all susceptible to these biases 
in one way, shape, or form. Uh, and so breaking that, I think, has been a little bit difficult, right? Because we sort of built out UX and UI research groups are so ingrained in, in that way of thinking. And again, I think they're useful for certain questions, but not all questions. Um, and then I think the, the second thing that we've learned is that there is a huge thirst for this type of research, for this type of knowledge. And academics, I'll include myself in that because I am part of that world. Uh, my Stanford advisor would hate me for saying this, but just academics haven't done a great job at making their research more user friendly. And so you have a couple of these like books that have blown up, like you know, predictably irrational or thinking fast and slow, that have pulled on just a couple of really interesting research tidbits. But there isn't necessarily a site that's meant for PMs or UX researchers. There isn't sort of a translated version of an academic article that says, here's the key takeaway, here's what we still don't know. Um, and I think that there's this out there, and it's, it's been hard to bridge that gap. Uh, first off, uh, phenomenal presentation, so thank you so much. Um, my question is based on um, the Jitterbug example and the Netflix example that you were just referring to. Yeah. Uh, and you talked about the paradox of choice. So my question is, um, how do you, like you talked about the browse mode versus the execution mode. So how do you get somebody from browse mode into execution mode? Because it seems like that's where the magic happens. Yeah. Um, that is something I would say that the literature is still trying to figure out. How do you increase that motivation for someone to just from browsing into execution? I mean, that's where you get into the whole world of default and like trying to create an opt-out world versus an opt-in world and trying to build your choice, your decision set so that on a relative basis, you look better, right? And so you have all of these things like the decoy effect to make decision making easier so that it's clear that yes, this is a no brainer. But I don't think we've found a like one shot arrow to try to move someone from browsing to execution mode. I think whoever finds that will become incredibly rich and will become a, a Nobel winner because I mean, this is what all companies are trying to figure out. So I don't, I don't I'm, unfortunately I don't think I have a, a good answer for you. So uh, kind of tailing along on that makes me think about the readers of a publication like Consumer Reports. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing, just totally guessing here, that there would be a much higher level of people who are in execution mode when they're looking through a Consumer Reports. And I wonder if anybody's ever studied the patterns of you know, investment and purchasing of that particular group of people who are spending money to get some sort of vaguely factual information about the products they buy? Um, yeah, so there is a lot of, of research thinking about the difference between a novice and an expert. And most people who are looking at these consumer reports tend to regard themselves as experts and how they go through a purchasing decision. They tend to um, rely much more on brand name than other people do. Um, they are, depending on the domain, they're more likely to, they're, they're, more fa they're faster at making a decision, even though they're reading these reports. Like once they've made up their mind, it's very hard to move them or change them from one way, shape, or form. Um, and so there's a bunch of literature out there looking at the differences between a novice and an expert. And there's a, a new budding research field looking at the, the world of aficionados. So people who, who have experience in wine, as an example, but aren't wine experts, right? So I frequent Napa, and I know the buzzwords that I'm supposed to say, but I'm really not an expert. And um, how does that change your decision making? That's a new field, and so new research is coming out. But um, I think Su Chi Shuang over at Stanford has done a bunch of work on that, if you want to take a look at that. And then Robbie Dar at Yale has also take, taken some. Yeah, and we still don't even know necessarily where that line exists between browse and execute. And for a lot of users, you can go back and forth. And when they do, it's still kind of you know, ambiguous for a lot of folks in industry. 
I know, because that's the current research I'm doing. <laughs> Three quick comments, and because I don't see any hands raised here, I may be the closing comment. One is, okay. I loved your observation about A-B testing being the new focus group. That is, people who are want some kind of research may refer to it by the name of a technique that I would not necessarily recommend in that particular circumstance, but they're using it as a generic. So great observation, love it. Number two, I heard w within the last two or three weeks some reports on NPR about why people would ch choose payday lending. And I don't know if you heard those two and, and I, uh, anybody else who's here. It was uh, very eye-opening to me because uh, payday lending seems like really a stupid choice, but it turns out to be pragmatically an excellent choice for the people who need it. And then the third comment was, lost it, I don't know. I'll think of it in, in, the, in the private comments time afterwards. I hope you'll stay and let people come approach you and everybody thank you for showing up. Next month, another fabulous speaker in the same location. Same time, second Tuesday of the month. Bring a friend. Hope to see you at the dinner earlier at 5.30. Thank you all. Thank you.